<laughs> Where does he get all those wonderful toys? Speaking of toys, boss, some of the guys were objecting to putting on these mime outfits. Bring them here! I will kill them! <laughs> you already killed six yesterday for not laughing at your pun about the Amazon. What's the best thing about getting pregnant in the Amazon? Next day delivery! <laughs> That's brilliant! Okay, well, they didn't laugh and you killed them and now we're running out of guys. Damn! I bet Marvel supervillains don't have these problems. What's Marvel? Never mind that! Let me think. Say, other than dressing up like a goofball, what exactly makes you a supervillain? You're just a normal guy who laughs like a hyena and crap like that. How dare you talk to the clown prince of crime that way! <laughs> you don't pay us. You don't have godlike powers. And you're always killing one of us. Why exactly do we even follow you? Because I have a great ass! Oh. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Welcome to Does This Still Work? The podcast that looks at always an ass. Does this still work? I'm Joe Dixon. And I'm George Ramacca, and today we're discussing Batman from 1989 and some historical context. First, podcasty stuff. You can reach us at dtswpod at gmail.com, on Facebook, Letterboxd, and our YouTube channel. Please tell your friends about us and leave five-star ratings everywhere. You can pick what we watch and get extra per-episode content by funding us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash dtswpod. Now, Joe, take us back to 1989. And I will uh, say again before I bring you back to 1989, because we've been there before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, we are technically still on Twitter, but we don't try and advertise that. <laughs> I need an alternative. I can't find anything decent. I'm sorry. Anyway, let's go back to 1989. This 1989 Batman movie is only the second feature length Batman movie, but it better captures the spirit of the character than the Batman movie made in 1966. Here, staples of all Batman movies going forward are established, including police corruption and revenge. With that in mind, let's take a look back at newspaper coverage from 1989 on those two issues. This is information I got from the San Luis Obispo Tribune, a newspaper published in California. Headline, George. Police corruption reported on the rise. It's good business for drug dealers to pay officers to look the other way. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> that's not in the headline. That was just a No, that's <laughs> me editorializing. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong, but this article focuses on cops being seduced by drug kingpin cash, with a number of law enforcement members swept up as defendants in the criminal justice system. I will now quote. In recent years, narcotics-related corruption has stained the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Customs Service, as well as local police. Among recent incidents of corruption that have come to light, more than 100 Detroit police officers are under investigation for suspected drug-related activities, and a dozen have been charged. Nine officers with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Narcotics Bureau were suspended in August and are under investigation for allegedly stealing cash confiscated and drug raids. This is a side note. I believe we actually covered that. <laughs> Back to the article. A former staff coordinator at Drug Enforcement Administration headquarters here was indicted in August for cocaine trafficking. Just how bad the problem is, however, is difficult to pin down. The Justice Department says there are no national statistics on police corruption. End quote. That business of not documenting police corruption on a national level is still true today. We also don't have national stats on police shootings. Nonprofits have to collect that data. The state does it, and that's outrageous, considering we pay for cops. We do know the cops on the take have motives like financial stresses of divorce, family tragedy, and plain old opportunistic greed. Make a bus and confiscate thousands of dollars? Who would notice if you pocket a bit? I'm sure it happens every day. Me too. Now, I don't want to give the impression that only drug dealers were bribing cops back in 1989. Bookies were doing that too. Headline, George. Corruption probe reportedly widening to include bribing of police by bookies. That's what I just said. Yep. You're a regular prophet, Joe. I am a prophet. But I read the news after it's already happened. Anyway, 
A grand jury was looking into possible indictments for an operation running out of Roxbury and the South End involving five bookies and at least two cops. It looks like police detectives received payoffs from a convicted bookie who at the time of this story was still running his illegal business out of a store on Blue Hill Avenue despite having been arrested four times over the last three years. The main bookie, as you might imagine, is alleged to be all mobbed up. I used to hear about the numbers racket when I was growing up, but I think these days most people use the state lottery. Do you think numbers running is still a thing these days, George? Like, is this still illegal gambling? There is still illegal gambling, but I think it's more about sports. I think that's where it's moved to. Oh, yeah, of course. Sure. Because people want to gamble some, and they don't sometimes want to actually pay the lottery. They want to feel like they're doing something bad. Like, at work, we used to do, like, Super Bowl boxes every year. Right. You're not supposed to do that at work. It's not legal, but everybody was in on it. So we all just got away with it. I don't know if it even still happens because I just made this decision years ago that I'm not going to gamble because odds, they're never in my favor. Yeah, and it's so silly of me to think this. Of course, it's still illegal gambling because if you do it illegally, you don't have to report under your taxes. Yep. So you're like, yeah, of course people still do it. It's, uh, I'm so naive sometimes. Sometimes, Joe. Sometimes. <laughs> you are a sweet summer child. Another theme of Batman is revenge. He is, after all, the spirit of vengeance. Nobody calls him that. Doesn't he call himself that? I have no idea. I just wanted to harken back to Mallrats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he calls himself that. I have one vengeance story I want to share with you all. I have to share, because I love it so much. This is from the Courier Post in New Jersey. Headline, George. That feeling of creative revenge might be wonderful. I'm just going to read this. She knew her husband was having an affair, and she wasn't going to take it anymore. So the woman waited till he came home drunk late one night. She watched him crawl naked into bed and fall quickly asleep. Then, as he lay snoring, she uncapped a tube of superglue and squeezed it onto his hand, which is cupping his privates. <laughs> the next morning, the Detroit husband awoke to find himself stuck in a compromising pose. He struggled one arm to get into a bathrobe. He struggled even harder to drive himself to an east side emergency room to get unglued. End quote. <laughs> How comfortable. How very uncomfortable. Any thoughts, George? You know, in 1989, John and Lorena Bobbitt got married. Ah, yes. And look what she did to him. Yep, it wasn't until 1993 that that happened, though. But that was the next thing that came to mind after reading this. Read this. Uh, for those who don't know, of course, Lorena Bobbitt is the one who cut off her husband, Ding Dong, and then they reattached it, and he went in to do some light porno for a couple of years. He was also uh, charged abuser. and convicted with a lot of, like, abuse and crime yeah, he because he was a horrible human off. being. He was a, he was a shitbag, without question. Allegedly. Yeah. No, he was convicted, right? We don't have to say allegedly. Yeah, yeah he was a shitbag. <laughs> he was a shitbag. But wow. By the way, why would you, why do you have to drive yourself to the emergency room? Just call the 911 and say, send an ambulance. My, like, I've been glued. I have to tell you something. If I woke up with my genitals, well, first of all, if I woke up with a wife, that would be a miracle in itself. That, was, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that cartoon I sent you about the guy with the raccoon? And it was like, I'm taking out the trash, honey. Okay, honey. Wait. I don't have a wife. And he goes into the kitchen. It's a raccoon in a wife suit. Yes. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be how you'd end up with the wife in that situation. <laughs> say, wait a minute. I don't have a wife. Yeah, but you just call 911 and tell them, like, send an ambulance. My genitals are messed up. I don't even have to explain why. Just like, why do I need to drive? Especially because it's going to be dangerous driving with one hand. Your other hand's on your junk. You know what I would do? What would you do? I would grab my paint thinner. Wouldn't that hurt even more? Have you put paint thinner on your genitals? Then ripping the skin off of your dick. Like, you can jet, you can apply it you, with one hand, if, as long as you can get it unscrewed. You can take, like, a Q-tip and apply it to where the super glue is to soften up the super glue. You don't have to apply it to your dick. Yeah, but, I mean, your hand is uh, glued to your private, so presumably a little of that stuff is still going to get on your genitalia. I, I'm, I'm assuming Again, that... that's what they're going to do in the, at the hospital. You don't even have to get to the hospital if you have, like, nail polish remover or paint thinner around. I guess, I just assume if they do it at the hospital, it'll make it a lot easier and gentler than if you do it yourself. But I don't know. I, but I imagine getting anything in that area is going to probably hurt. But you know what I would do first, Joe? Not having an affair? 
I would not have an affair, correct. I would not do something to make my partner even think about super gluing my you-know-what to my hand. I mean, obviously, this is already a troubled marriage. Did it even get to that point? Yeah. Forget the affair. I mean, if I was really upset with my spouse, my first thought would be, you know what? I'm going to glue their genitalia. I mean, it's just, it's the amount of anger that would have, to, there has to be more than just the affair, I suspect, going on there. Agreed. They'd have to be cheating on you with, like, me. <laughs> I'm thinking is that if there is some sort of problem in the marriage, the answer is not, you know what, let's do something. I mean, this is a violent act. I mean, I'm joking about it. And I think it's amusing. But honestly, this is <laughs> don't let it get to that point. If you're at the point of your marriage where you want to harm your partner, just leave. Yep. And that is consistent advice that I give to people <laughs> is the moment you think you want to hurt your partner. Get the frack out of that relationship because it's not going to work anymore. Frack? Do you really say frack? I just got done re-watching the entire Battlestar Galactica series Oh, I again. see. Okay. That's what's in my vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, but just leave. Leave. Don't, don't, don't do anything, because it's just, it's, it's bad. But you know who doesn't get married? Batman. Or Bruce Wayne. That's true. Although, actually, in the comic book, he plans to get married. He's going to marry Catwoman, but then she decided to call it off. Yeah, because she's Catwoman. She's a cat. She's cat. She's going to yep. do what she wants. <laughs> and also, bats and cats can't mate, so... I made that reference last episode. Did we? I did. Ah. Anyway, George tells about Batman 1989. All right. This was directed by Tim Burton. And for the show, we also saw that he directed Pee-wee's Big Adventure. I've also seen his Beetlejuice. Yep. Sleepy Hollow. Yep. And Mars Attacks. I've also seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Corpse Bride, and Edward Scissorhands. Is Edward Scissorhands on our list? Because that probably should be. It should. I mean, every one of these movies should be on our list. Hmm. Also written by Bob Kane, because Bob Kane automatically wrote anything Batman ever. Sam Hamm, a man with rhyming first and last names. And Warren Scarin, another guy with rhyming first and last names. <laughs> Assuming you just pronounce the name that way. It's S K A. A-R-E-N. Yeah. For Batman 66, we discussed the fact that Bob Kane wasn't a screenwriter, and he's just included here because he was one of the creators of Batman. Why Batman's co-creator, Bob Finger, has never received proper credit is chronicled elsewhere, and you can Google it. But suffice it to say, he was responsible for a lot of the elements that made Batman, Batman. Sam Hamm was the creator of Mantis, a show I've mentioned previously on this podcast, first black superhero TV show. And he also wrote Batman Returns. Warren Scarin, Scarin, Starin, whatever, uh, wrote Beetlejuice, Beverly Hills Cop 2, and Top Gun. <laughs> we saw Beverly Hills Cop 2 for an unaired test episode. And Top Gun we saw for the pod. I already did that theme song. You did. I'm not doing it again. But you can't do the blurbs. I can do blurbs. IMDb says, The dark knight of Gotham City begins his war on crime with his first major enemy being Jack Napier, a criminal who becomes the clownishly homicidal Joker. Mm. That's a lot of words to say it's Batman vs. Joker. Indeed. Amazon and HBO Max say, The caped crusader saves dismal Gotham City and gorgeous Vicky Vale from the freaky Joker. <laughs> The freaky Joker makes it sound like something else. Amazon's having fun with it. <laughs> In the porn version, it's the freaky Joker. <laughs> I don't know what this version really is. Freaky. Or maybe that's just me when I hear the word freaky. Hey. It's not Freaky Friday, of course. I'm not going to kink shame. The first scene is an echo of the Batman origin story involving a family of tourists in Gotham City who are trying not to look like tourists. The father, Harold, is playing the I-know-what-I'm-doing-and-failing-to-hail-a-cab. A hooker hits on Jimmy, the probably 11-year-old son, <laughs> who is using a map to tell his father that they're going the wrong way. They end up going down an alley and being assaulted by muggers who knock the father out before taking his wallet and running off. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what it is about Gotham City, but apparently it has a lot of alleys. <laughs> and they're all dangerous. They're Every all last dangerous. one of them at all times. At all times. Just incredibly dangerous. You think they just close up the alleys or something? Like, that would cut down crime in half. Mm-hmm. We should also set the scene here a bit, because this film is to the 1966 Batman as night is to day. Gotham here is dark, dangerous, and crime-riddled. 
People are selfish and only ever looking out for themselves. It's the kind of city where you absolutely avoid alleyways because it is a sure thing that what happened to this family will happen to anybody. Uh, basically, Gotham City is what Fox News thinks New York is. Yep. High above the street, Batman watches this all happen, waiting until afterwards to intervene. <laughs> Which is weird, don't you think? Was that bizarre to you? I think that's on brand for Batman. You really think he wait until they commit the crime first? He always does. Hmm. Oh, you may be right. The muggers settle on a rooftop to split their loot. One is skeptical about the rumors of a Batman terrorizing the criminal element of the city. That is, until Batman shows up. The skeptic fires a gun, and Batman falls down on purpose because, and I have to keep saying this, bullets fired from a 38 have just enough penetrating power to be dangerous to humans, but do not have the ability to transfer enough kinetic energy to knock a person down. <laughs> then he gets up, because that looks more dramatic, kicks the other mugger through a door. Then he dangles the skeptic off of the rooftop. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. I want you to do me a favor. Smash that like and subscribe button. <laughs> I understand this isn't realistic, but it's trying for a certain level of realism. And honestly, if you're, I, I want to say criminal, but honestly, if you're just anybody, if some dude comes with a cape and bat ears, <laughs> what did you, wouldn't your first instinct be to laugh? I mean, I realize, oh, this is a bat person out there. I would see that and I wouldn't be able to control myself. and just laugh hilariously because it's like this goofball. Well, the thing is, they're the criminal element in the city, and Batman has been doing stuff for a little while, so the rumors have gone. So there's a pre-established expectation that this guy is going to kick their asses. Right, but would you still be afraid of someone walking around like that? Your first instinct, even if you heard rumors about him, you'd be like, this is what people are afraid of? Ha ha ha! Bang, 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 bang! Almost everybody in Gotham City is wearing black, and Batman's wearing more black than everybody else. So... I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Gotham City is a, a goth town. I don't know if you realize that or not. Yeah, it's in the name. Yes! Batman slash, and I'm sorry, spoiler alert, Bruce Wayne, <laughs> is played by Michael Keaton, who we saw for the show in Mr. Mom. And I've seen him in Beetlejuice. Yep. Birdman. Yep. Spotlight. Morbus. The Trial of the Chicago 7. Spider-Man Homecoming. The Other Guys. Out of Sight. And Jackie Brown. A film we will be doing very soon. And I've also seen him in Multiplicity. While this is going on, the mayor is holding a benefit dinner and introducing the new district attorney, Harvey Dent. This actor will never get to play Two-Face. Nope. He promises that Dent will root out the source of Gotham's corruption, capitalism. I mean, mob boss Carl Grissom, who we'll get into in a few. Harvey Dent takes the mic to tell the city that Commissioner Gordon has mapped out Grissom's front businesses. The mayor is played by Lee Wallace. And I've seen that gentleman in The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, the 1974 version. He played the mayor, hmm. looking just like Ed Koch. New Yorkers don't know what that reference means. And also, he was in Private Benjamin and Clute. Harvey Dent is played by Billy D. Williams. Why is he in this movie? He has nothing to do. But anyway, Billy D. Williams I've seen in The Ladies' Man, Mahogany, Lady Sings the Blues, Brian's Song, and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, and Star Wars Return of the Jedi. I don't do that episode bullshit. Yeah, well, I saw him in Star Wars Episodes 5, 6, and 9. You're younger than me. Commissioner Gordon is played by Pat Hengel. And I've seen him in The Falcon and the Snowman. I've filmed my reference many a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hang Him High, Shaft, the 2000 version. God, we're going to be doing that so much. Point out which version of the films we actually saw because they keep remaking everything. Anyway. Because, and we cannot stress this enough, Hollywood has run out of ideas. <laughs> oh, actually, we're gonna, we'll discuss that in the post show. Anyway, I also seen him in The Super Cops and On the Waterfront. And I heard his voice in The Land Before Time. When was that? Before time, Joe. Oh, okay. I don't have a way to answer that question if it was before time. How did they take time when it was before time? Well, it was dinosaurs. They didn't give a shit. Ah. Elsewhere in the city, Jack Napier, one of Grissom's top enforcers, watches while fiddling with his lucky deck of cards. He dismisses any threat posed by Dent and Gordon, while his lover, Alicia, remarks that if Grissom knew Jack was stooping his girl, Jack would be in trouble himself. Jack dismisses Grissom as old, weak, and ignorant. Jack Napier... And spoiler, the Joker hmm. is played by Jack Nicholson, who we saw for the show in Easy Rider, Chinatown, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Terms of Endearment. 
And I've also seen him in The Departed, Mars Attacks, The Little Shop of Horrors in 1960. Again, another remake. Uh, the Shining. Yep. Wolf. A Few Good Men. Broadcast News. The Witches of Eastwick. Prince's Honor. The Last Detail. Yep. Carnal Knowledge. And Five Easy Pieces. And I've also seen him in As Good As It Gets and Anger Management. And Alicia is played by Jerry Hall. I don't know her credits, but I know she was married to Mick Jagger, then Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. I just, I just wonder, how do you do that? I mean, I'm presuming they have two different politics. How do you go from Mick Jagger to Rupert Murdoch? Good question, Joe. Anyway, doesn't matter. That's not what the show is about. On the street near the mugging, the muggers are being carted away in an ambulance. Police Lieutenant Eckert sees this as another in an increasing number of reports of small-time criminals being beat up by, in his words, a giant menacing supernatural form, kind of like a bat. An investigative reporter, Alexander Knox, tries to get a statement. Eckert blows him off. Lieutenant, is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? And if so, is he on the police payroll? And if so, what's he pulling down? After taxes. Knox looked really pleased with himself for saying that. Yes. Knox seems very pleased about a lot of things for some bizarre reason. He's like one of the most ineffectual people in his picture. Mm hmm. Eckert is played by William Hootkins. And I've seen him in Indiana Jones and Razor Lost Ark. Yep. Star Wars. Yep. And Flash Gordon. Alexander Knox is played by Robert Wool, <laughs> who we saw for the show in Good Morning Vietnam. And I've also seen him in Bull Durham. Around a corner, in another of Gotham's endless, dark, dirty, steam-filled alleys, <laughs> Jack waits by a car that his best friend Bob the Goon is wiping down. He tosses Eckert a sandwich wrapper filled with money, a payoff to get Dent to stop sniffing around one of the front companies. Then Jack and Eckert get into an argument over boundaries, mental health, and career pathways. Hmm. Bob the Goon is played by Tracy Walter, who we saw for the show... I think he was uncredited in Annie Hall. I've also seen him in Serpico, Repo Man, The Sons of the Lambs. Yep. City Slickers. Yep. Conan the Destroyer. Man on the Moon. Independence Day. Yep. Amos and Andrew. And The Hospital. And I've seen him in Aaron Brockovich. A recurring theme in the film will be the planning, execution, and budgeting of the Gotham City Bicentennial Parade and Festival. For the entire film, it will be over budget and people will be scared of all the criming so they won't show up anyway. Which makes sense. At work, Knox navigates the jeers and ridicule of his co-workers for chasing after a cryptid conspiracy theory. At his desk, he finds someone who actually believes him. Vicki Vale is a photojournalist of some renown, recently having covered a bloody U.S.-backed revolution in Corto Maltese, a fictional island off of Argentina that only exists in the DC Comics universe. She wants to team up and find the Batman. To that end, she has acquired two tickets to a charity fundraiser at Wayne Manor so that Knox can join her and maybe get a quote from the mayor or Commissioner Gordon. Vicki Vale is played by Kim Basinger, and we saw her for the show in L.A. Confidential. <laughs> and I've seen her in The Nice Guys, Wayne's World 2, and Never Say Never Again. And I've seen her in 8 Mile. Vicki Vale is so clearly a knockoff of Lois Lane but she is the worst representation of a female reporter I think I've ever seen in a freaking movie. Well, I guess it's probably some are slightly worse than this, but not by much. She's not a reporter. She is a photojournalist. Oh, fine. A photojournalist. She still is bad at her job. She sucks. Her job is to take pictures of things. Her whole existence for this film is just to get kidnapped, which even Lois Lane has more agency than this woman does. Lois Lane constantly being needed Superman, but she still manages to go out and do her own thing. This woman is just dedicated to Batman. She comes to town for Batman, and she only is interested in Batman, and then sleeps with Bruce Wayne, who conveniently is Batman. Pathetic. In the mob version of a casual board meeting, Carl Grissom queries the damage that would result if Harvey Dent links their organization with Axis Chemicals. The, the company. Not like Zyklon B. Ah, Jesus. Yes, let's bring in a Nazi reference, sure. Ultimately, it's deemed prudent to do an old-fashioned cover-up. Go in, grab any records, and destroy them. Grissom very affectionately tasks Jack with this, which he is to handle personally. So I'm assuming that in 1989 Gotham, because this is like present era, right? It's supposed to be the same era we're living in at the time this movie came out? Sure. This stuff isn't on computers? It's all just paper? Criminal organizations aren't fast to adopt new IT trends. <laughs> 
Grissom is played by Jack Palance. You mind seeing the City Slickers? Yep. City Slickers 2, The Young Guns, and The Big Knife. Which, oddly enough, even though it's called The Big Knife, is not a film noir. It's actually about a Hollywood actor who gets in trouble because he drinky drinky and has an auto accident hurting an actress and the whole hullabaloo about that. Hullabaloo. And I've seen him in Tango and Cash. At the benefit event, Bruce Wayne pretends to not be himself, while his faithful butler Alfred manages to not only serve guests, but also prevent an impossibly careless and clumsy Bruce from embarrassing himself as he slack-jawed follows Vicky around. (laughs) Now, am I wrong about this? Do people not know who Bruce Wayne is? Do they not say that several times? Like, who's this Bruce Wayne guy? Am I nuts? Did I not remember that correctly? People know that he's a millionaire, but he doesn't make a lot of public appearances. It just seems weird. He's the richest guy in town, at least according to Batman lore, and yet no one knows who he is? No one has any pictures of him? That seems unlikely. Especially when they have photographs of him as a child in the newspaper when his parents got shot. Yeah, but that's on microfiche, and it took like 10 scenes for Knox to find it. <laughs> Alfred is played by Michael Gaw. Are you going to do that with all the last names? Only if I can. <laughs> For the show, we saw him in Boys from Brazil. And he was in Sleepy Hollow. Yep, and also Corpse Bride. Knox, meanwhile, is having no luck getting quotes from anyone. He and Vicky end up in the Wayne Arsenal, an eclectic assortment of armor and weapons from around the world. Bruce meets them there and properly introduces himself, expressing admiration for both journalists' work. Alfred arrives to tell Bruce that Commissioner Gordon had to leave rather suddenly, and Bruce excuses himself. Hey, wait a minute. I just realized something. Okay, so people don't really know who Bruce Wayne is for some bizarre reason. So why have a charity auction that draws attention to yourself? It's not an auction. It's just a charity benefit for charity dump benefit money into bowls. Why, why draw attention to yourself? And why have it at Bruce Wayne Manor? Have it somewhere else and not be there. Interestingly, for the same reason that Vicki Vale got two tickets for her and Knox. Because the script says so? Because by inviting all of the city's most powerful, he can gather information, which is exactly what happens. That he couldn't get if he had it at- Right now. That it couldn't have happened if he had it at a hotel or something? He doesn't have to be there. He, he physically, number one, doesn't have to be there. And number two, he doesn't have to have it at his place. In the Batcave, Bruce watches footage from earlier in the film without any of the comic overtones of, say, Spaceballs. He sees a cop informing Gordon that Jack Napier is cleaning out Axis Chemicals and that Eckert is involved. Gordon and the cop bail on the party. He would have had to gone in and pre-wired surveillance stuff in a hotel ballroom to do that. Whereas he can have cameras all over his house and nobody's going to notice. This is Batman. This is exactly something he would do. It's not like he doesn't do that. He doesn't have to do the extra work of wiring up a different place when he has this one wired up already. But he could. Because he's Batman. And then he gives him full range of his house. He lets him just walk around his house. Why? They couldn't just stay in the ballroom? They don't stay in the ballroom. They just don't want He around. has cameras everywhere. People are more likely to be honest and talk about secret things in a room where nobody else is. So he's just basically, he just let people wander around his house because he's, he's recording everybody. How does he, he's just one person. He's going to catch everyone's conversation. On tape. And then he can go through it at his leisure. <laughs> That'll take so much time. Or Alfred can tell him exactly which camera to for footage to look at because he saw the commissioner leave in a hurry. Right, because he's almost interested in the commissioner. That's all he's interested in, as near as I can tell. But anyway, go on. To be clear here, Eckert is there to kill Jack on Grissom's orders because Grissom absolutely does know that Jack has been stooping Alicia. Grissom sent Jack into a trap, which Jack discovers when the safe they're supposed to clean out is already empty. A firefight erupts between Eckert's cops and Jack's goons, joined shortly by Batman and then by Commissioner Gordon and a small army of other cops. Jack shoots Eckert, and that's the end of that character. Uh Jack tries to shoot Batman, who takes a page from Wonder Woman's playbook and deflects the bullet with his own gauntlets. The bullet ricochets through Jack's face. Stunned, he tumbles into a vat of green liquid and vanishes. They call it acid. I'm calling bullshit because you don't survive that. You could survive a bleaching agent of some kind, which would explain what happens to him. Just, uh, oh God, I, just so much. All right. I mean, you're not wrong about the ass. I don't, I don't care what you call it. I, I, I get it. It's necessary because they're going to make him the Joker. But honestly, how is he much different than where he already was? He doesn't gain any superpowers. All this happens now is that his face is white. I mean, literally white. White, white, not Crayola peach white, like white people think white. No, that's what I'm saying. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I get it. I, I agree with the premise of your cold open, Joe. <laughs> He's just a dude. Joker is not a super villain. He's just psychotic and has access to money somehow. Mm. Batman escapes in a cloud of smoke before Gordon's men can arrest him. The next day, Knox and Vicky are discussing Batman. Knox tries one of the many times he does to get into her pants to no avail because she's got a date with Bruce Wayne. Because of course she does. Because of course she does. We join the date at Wayne Manor at a comically long table with Vicky and Bruce seated at opposite ends. A request for salt involves Bruce walking the length of that dining hall, all seemingly for the punchline of, I'm so filthy rich in this ginormous mansion that I don't think in all my years that I've been in this room before. Batman is socially awkward, I guess, right? I mean, he's like still traumatized over watching his parents get shot, which is not an unreasonable thing to be traumatized over. But he's smart enough to have all these cameras, he's following people, and he's doing all this bat stuff that he creates. Presumably, he creates most of the weapons and stuff on his own. Yet somehow, he doesn't understand, I'm having a date come over, and this is a date. Why would he have a long table like that? He almost never has guests over anyway. So why? He, but he says there's one woman over. Why not just, why does he do this? Other than you're like, the script says so, and it's supposed to be this comedic. The hey. script says so. That's why, Joe. It's a long way to get to the, because the script said so. Mm. They retire to the kitchen for a more intimate meal while Alfred regales Vicky with stories of Bruce's youth. Alfred excuses himself and Bruce expresses great affection for his old employee. Mm. What? Just quickly, what do you think of Alfred? I have a hard time separating just growing up knowing who Alfred is from what I know now about like labor relations. <laughs> So I think he was the Wayne family butler, and when the parents died, he basically took care of the kid. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's obviously true. I mean, it's a steady gig in a nice house, and he's got a comfy bed. <laughs> he is the magical servant, who basically has no other life other than to serve, let's say it, master. Yep. Because that's what this thats what this is. It's, it is, I mean, looking, you're right, and, and, and growing up watching it, you think nothing of it. But as you get older and you understand, yeah, like you said, uh, employee, employer relationships, mm -hmm. there's something really actually disturbing about this that people honestly think, oh, I'm so rich. And here's this guy who just worships me and helps me with everything, has no life of his own. He has no family. He has no friends. He's just there for me. Ugh. I mean, Bruce even says it. I couldn't find my socks without him. You're a grown ass man who runs around Gotham dressed like a bat and you need help folding your frickin laundry. <sighs> he also helps him with women, as we'll find out later. Yeah. Bruce and Vicky make their way upstairs, up a lot of stairs, hmm. to the bedroom for some whoopee making. And afterwards, Vicky falls asleep first, curled in Bruce's arms. She's awoken to the sound of squeaking at 3 a.m. and sees Bruce hanging upside down like Oscar in the doorway to the annex in the office. You know, like a bat. Mm. That same night, in an underground back alley surgery place like you'd find in Fallout, Jack Napier is getting his face worked on. He finds the results absolutely hilarious. He stumbles from the surgeon's office and makes his way to Grissom's penthouse. Grissom is, of course, surprised to see his old friend and enforcer, although... That's not who Jack is anymore. In fact... Jack is dead, my friend. You can call me Joker. Joker proceeds to laugh his ass off as he empties his gun into his old boss and the window behind him, who improbably falls backwards from in front of his desk <laughs> to land in the chair behind it. <laughs> what did you think of what he says to him before he shoots him? He goes, dude did this for a woman. How would you pray for a woman? I mean, like, screw you, man. <laughs> you know what he's saying there? He's saying bros before hoes. No, 100%. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's garbage. Yeah, it's I'm toxic careful. masculine garbage. Because we all expected Joker to be a paragon of non-toxic <laughs> masculinity or something. I just, I just get the feeling, and maybe this is wrong on my part, I get the feeling the film doesn't disagree with him. No, it doesn't. Anyway. I mean, it's Tim Burton. <laughs> I mean, we got a, a lame-ass Vicky Vale, and then we got this stuff. I, I'm sorry, I just, I think it's there. Mm -hmm. Later, sitting in Grissom's chair, Joker sees a headline about Batman terrorizing people and says, in his own way, hold my beer. Mm. In the morning, Vicky wants to do lunch, and Bruce is like, I'm going out of town forever, so rain check? 
He does this without telling Alfred, and Alfred, for all his years as Bruce's butler, doesn't know to just yes and, so when Vicky mentions the trip to Alfred on the way out, Alfred totally blows Bruce's alibi. <laughs> wow, I didn't even catch that. You're right. <laughs> he knows who Bruce is. He works with them. He swear for all of this. Yeah, when you get back. Back, Miss Vale. <laughs> it's not obvious that Bruce told you something in order to get you to think we're not going to be here, so I shouldn't play along with this. Maybe he's just bad at improv. I think he just doesn't know how to yes and. Yeah. Absolutely. So she follows Bruce <laughs> as he goes to the spot where his parents were murdered and watches as he leaves two roses on the ground where they died. Mm. Why would you want to go to the place where your parents are shot? He dresses like a bat and runs around Gotham beating up poor people. <laughs> like, don't question why he does the things he does. He's damaged goods. That's why. <laughs> that same morning, Joker calls together all of Grissom's underbosses to claim Grissom's place at the top. The assembled are skeptical, to say the least. Joker kills one of them with an impossible hand buzzer thing that incinerates the dude and then has his goons clear everyone out. And I say that hand buzzer is impossible for the same reason that Scientology frickin' auditing things with the e-meter doesn't work. If you're going to have current go through a human body, you need higher voltage than a 9-volt battery is going to give. And there's no way he has even a 9-volt battery in a hand buzzer. It also needs a complete current pathway. Like, even if it had two taser leads on it and had enough power in it to be a taser, it would burn the guy's hand. It would not incinerate him under his clothing. <laughs> Later, outside City Hall, one of those underbosses holds his own press conference, saying that Grissom left him in charge. Bruce wanders over to the commotion as the area fills with, of all things, mimes. Then Joker pulls up in a limo, quotes Edward Bullier Lytton about pens and swords, then sticks a presumably poisoned quill pen right into that underboss's neck. The underboss has his own goons. You think as soon as this guy came near him, their guns would have been out. But for some reason, they're like, yeah, sure, come on up here and get as close to our boss as possible. Close enough to stab him in the neck. They underestimated the power of the pen. <laughs> Joker didn't have a gun out. He had a pen. Why are you going to pull a gun, a gun on a guy with a pen? Because he's coming near your boss regardless. Dressed like a mime for some reason. He was not dressed like a mime. Wasn't he? Didn't he have on the black cap and everything? Am I thinking that? Remember that wrong? He had a top hat on. But he's, he looked like the other mimes, didn't he? No, he looked like a clown because he's the fucking Joker. The mimes were all wearing the black and white striped shirts and the French hats. I thought he was also wearing similar uh, outfits. No, because he got out of a limo. Right, but he was wearing a black and white outfit. What's, oh, who no, he wasn't. Never mind. I've seen this movie, like, I, I, way more times than I'm comfortable admitting. I, I'm sorry I brought it up. Let's just move on. <laughs> Me too, Joe. Me too. Then the mime army opens fire, blanketing the area with Tommy gun fire as Joker makes his escape. Where the fuck were these mimes hiding these guns, Joe? <laughs> because we see them miming their way into the area, patting kids on the head, doing the frickin' wall thing. None of them has a Tommy gun in sight. Where were they keeping these weapons? <laughs> Where was law enforcement? There's people just shooting in the street in front of a courthouse, Where was right? law enforcement right outside of City Hall? <laughs> Good question, Joe. Bruce just watches intently, doesn't take cover, and ends up with a bullet hole in his jacket. Vicky spots him, and now he knows that she knows that he was lying, so he makes himself scarce. This will never come up again. No. Later, Joker watches the aftermath of him killing that mob boss on the steps of City Hall, and well, he's not happy about the coverage. Can somebody tell me what kind of a world we live in where a man dressed up as a bat gets all of my press? Alfred thinks Bruce should put more effort into wooing Vicky than being batty. Bruce is like 95% focused on Jape Near being alive as the Joker. Vicky, as far as Alfred knows, is just basically a one-night stand. I mean, he, he really doesn't know that much about the woman. He knows what he told her about Bruce. But they, uh, we really don't know much about her, other than she's like a famous photojournalist. Well, she does lift the spirits when she's here. She does bring an air of carefree wonderment or whatever the hell Alfred says. <laughs> like, he gets a good heebie-jeebie about her. <laughs> By the way, I just realized something. 
All right, I, I get, well, I guess he does know about her work, but there's no effort to look at her background at all, which seems a bit strange for a guy who's so secretive about his identity. He's about to bring this woman into his life. Maybe find out a little bit more about her. We will find out how bad he is at being judges of character when he ends up trying to go after Catwoman. So, <laughs> true. Vicky calls Alex and asks him to find out about the corner where Bruce's parents were murdered. She refers to it by street intersection because she doesn't know Batman's origin story yet. Earlier, Joker had sent Bob the Goon on a photo recon mission to follow Knox around since Knox is the closest thing to an expert on Batman as existed at the time. Bob returns, and amidst the photos, Joker sees Vicky and immediately develops a psychotic obsession with her. Because of course he does. Because of course. That obsession doesn't mean he's still not psychotically in charge of a giant mob empire with access to an entire chemical factory. He turns that into an apparatus of death to taint somehow only Gotham City's supplies of sanitary and makeup products <laughs> with an agent that causes uncontrollable laughter and then death with the victim's face paralyzed into a Joker-like grin. The city sees one of its own news anchors die in that way on live TV before the Joker cuts in with a commercial for his new Smilex ingredient. Okay, I'm a mob boss. I'm not working for Joker. Where's our cut in this? I mean, how are we making any money from this? Mob bosses tend to want to make money. They're not just mob bosses for the fun of it. He may be doing this for fun. What do they get out of all this? Joker is famously unconcerned with money. Yes. He is. Except in 1966, because that Joker was very much okay with holding the members of the Security Council for a giant ransom. That's true. Yes. That one did do that. After that, <laughs> this movie and onward, Joker does not really care about money. Right. Of course. In fact, in the one with Heath Ledger, he lights a giant pile of money on fire in front of the mob bosses to say, I don't give a shit about money. Right. Some people just want to set the world on fire. I, I saw that movie. Yep. It still brings it back to the question. He has people working for him. My bosses, other my bosses, they're looking at this and going like, oh, yeah. Why is anybody work for a Joker? Good question, Joe. <laughs> for the same reason that people were in the Trump administration. <laughs> but they did make money, though. Accidentally. Especially his son-in-law. Yeah. Made like, a, what, a billion dollars from the Saudis. Sorry. The same reason that right-wing people in red states voted for Trump. Okay. That I'll accept as an answer. <laughs> they don't actually make any money. They just don't care. They also want to see the world burn. Okay. Yep. Bruce watches all of this on TV, and in the information Alfred gives him about Napier, he sees that Jack had an aptitude for chemistry. So he and Alfred go shopping. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. They do. He it says, just it sounds funny. <laughs> Let's go shopping. That's what that's. And no, it is in the screen. You know, you're right. I'm just saying, it's, it's, I, I laughed. The City Hall bunch have another conversation about the Bicentennial Festival, this time with the added complication of, you know, Joker poisoning people. Bruce gets a message from Alfred from Vicky that she'll be late to their date at the museum. Bruce realizes that they don't actually have a date at the museum, so he goes to get his costume on. And that was the first thing today that reminded me about that comic strip with the raccoon. <laughs> Wait, I don't have a date with her today. <laughs> How long did it take him to finally get there? I mean, between the phone call, she's not there yet. So she's going there, right? Am I wrong? She's not only there a yet. couple of seconds. It, it only took him, like, he walked, he got that message on his way out of the room, then, like, came back into the room. Wait, I'm not meeting her today. No, no, no. no. I'm not talking about that. But I'm thinking, how long it seemed to take him to get there? Didn't it seem to take an unusually long time from finally to arrive there to rescue Vicky? I mean, he had to get to the back cave. He did not have a fireman's pole with an instant costume change letter. <laughs> okay. And I guess he has no bat copter either. Right. He does have a bat plane, but it's way harder to find parking for that. Although, how does he get on the roof? I don't know. He does bust through the window at that point. In fact, he's on the roof a couple of times. He does have the grapple gun and shit. Yeah, I guess. God, that must really... How bad can that screw up your arms and shoulders after a while constantly... Pulling yourself. Isn't that bad for your back? Am I nuts? Isn't it like. Isn't I think climbing? he might be nuts. I mean, he obviously is the best shape uh, Michael Keaton that we ever will see of Michael Keaton. So, <laughs> I don't know. Your body can do a lot of stuff if you take care of it. I guess, but I'm fairly sure uh, when you climb a lot of mountains, it screws up your back. But, anyway. but the thing is, he's not pulling himself on the rope. He fires the gun and it pulls him up. Oh my God. Wouldn't that dislocate your shoulder? If it pull yanked you like. That, but it can't because he weighs things and it's a gun with a spring. So it can't be like, and this is all assuming that that's even fucking possible. I want to say it's not possible. Anyway. 
Vicky gets to the museum and is seated. Before long, a box arrives with a gas mask and a note to put it on. And this is way before COVID. Hmm. I mean, I know they have cafeterias or whatever, you know, lunch, whatever in the Why museum. is there a restaurant in the fucking museum? Good question, Joe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a moment later, the ventilation system starts sending out a purple haze. Nothing to do with Jimi Hendrix. Mm. And everyone but Vicky keels over dead. Some of them do pretty good falls. <laughs> Joker and his goons come in, blasting Prince from a boombox, and vandalize their way up to where Vicky is sitting. You know, maybe that's what the Purple Haze is for. It's for Prince. He literally does say Prince when they play, before they play the music. They say, like, cue Prince or whatever he says. Pretty much all of the music in this that wasn't scored by Danny Elfman was Prince. Yeah. Yeah. So he knows who's on the recording. Prince has nothing to do with Purple Haze. That was a Jimi Hendrix album. album. Yeah. But maybe that's, he's a joker. He's insane. So the joker can't tell black artists apart. Wouldn't be impossible. Now, you know what? It's as good as an explanation as anything in this movie. I mean, purple rain, purple haze. What's the difference? Three letters. <laughs> the joker describes himself to Vicky as the world's first homicidal artist and brings out Alicia, whose face he has disfigured as a showpiece. When Vicky says she doesn't know anything about Batman, Joker tries to squirt acid at her, and then she throws a pitcher of water into his face. He plays injured, then reveals the water to be removing his skin tone makeup, revealing the white underneath. Then Batman drops through the ceiling, fires a zip line into two walls, grabs Vicky, and skedaddles with her through the front door. They get into the Batmobile, and Joker gives one of the most often quoted lines from this film. Get those wonderful toys. And in case that sound quality sucked, he says, where does he get those wonderful toys? In fact, Jay said that in uh, Mallrats. Yes. And what's odd is that he himself has wonderful toys, right? I mean, uh -huh. so he probably gets in the same place you do, dude. However you get yours. <laughs> I mean, he literally has a helicopter. He, Batman doesn't have a helicopter. The Joker does with his face on, or at least a... It's, it's, it's the face of a Joker or the side. A logo. Yeah. A logo, yes. He's got branding. Yeah. The Batmobile ends up stuck in traffic, so Batman and Vicky get out on foot. He commands the car to raise its shields, which covers it impossibly in metal plating. <laughs> Why doesn't Batman sell some of this stuff as Bruce Wayne? Because it would be become saved? really obvious that he's <laughs> Batman if he did that. <laughs> Well, he's got to get this material from somewhere. He could have initially introduced it as Wayne, and then he could have gotten it from him, pretended he got it from him. In fact, that's how he does it in the newer movies. You are correct, sir. Everything is a Wayne Enterprise front company. It's like the mob does it, but it's just a cult of personality. Mm. <laughs> the pair end up in an alleyway because of fun. Of course. <laughs> Vicky lies about her weight, causing Batman to have to fight longer before they can make their escape. The goons realize he's a human in armor and try to lift his mask. Vicky tries to get a picture of that, and the Flash distracts the goons long enough for Batman to pummel them. Now, do you think he was really out? Because ideally, nearly... No, he was not off. actually out. He was playing possum. Why would he let them almost take off his mask, though? Because they do come close to pulling it off, if you remember. The mask is lifted up off his face. He was and then a she took second away from acting when Vicky fired her Flash bulb off <laughs> and gave them distraction and distracted them so he could just do stuff. Batman drives them through the woods. When Vicky looks too closely, he turns on a light to basically blind her so that she can't. Dude thought of everything, I guess. Hmm. I mean, the fact that the Batmobile is a two-seater is itself almost an oddity for this incarnation of the character. Hmm. In the Batcave, Batman gives her the research he's done about the poisoned cosmetics, that the poison only activates if certain products are combined together. Then he roofies her so, so that he can take the film with the, her picture of the goons lifting his mask. <laughs> Only fucking explanation for what happens. <laughs> I'm not disagreeing. How else does she wake up in her own bed fully clothed but missing the film? That, did that not seem, I don't even know how to put it. Rapey? Yes! Yeah! Because <laughs> he, he says there's one more thing I want, then he brings up his cape, and the next thing you know, you see her laying in bed. I'm like, dude, what? are you doing? And I mean, uh -huh. dude, as in Tim Burton, what are you suggesting for at least a split second there? No, no, I think this is kind of on brand for Tim Burton. <laughs> That's like your up Tim Burton. For, what, what do you know about him that I don't? <laughs> I, I, just, I just listened to a, a God-awful movie's bonus episode on, planet, on the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. Bad? 
he really wanted, you know, some Marky Mark and Helena Bonham Carter in a monkey outfit action going on, but <laughs> okay. the studio wouldn't let him. Mm. That's the takeaway. <laughs> And then she married him. She married him after that movie. It's fucking weird. Uh, not as much as Jerry Hall, but okay. Eh. So yeah, Vicky wakes up in her own bed, fully clothed, missing that film. But regardless, she immediately contacts Knox to get the word out that Batman cracked Joker's cosmetics code. In short order, the local news station is disseminating that information, putting an end to Joker's homicidal prank. Then Bruce meets with Vicky at her place and tries to tell her the truth about being Batman, but can only eke out a strained metaphor that can also be interpreted as I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> if he hadn't slept with her, you'd almost think he was about to announce that he was gay. Yeah. Then the Joker barges in to exposit that Alicia is dead, so there's nobody in the way of their love or something. Well, except Bruce, who slid a metal tray under his shirt as soon as he saw Joker walk in. Bruce tries to goad Joker into a fist fight, but the Joker declines and shoots Bruce instead, but not before saying this. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? That'll become relevant later. Yeah. By the way, how did, I mean, I know Batman's supposed to be brilliant and everything, but how did he know that that thing would stop a bullet? That I is mean, one big I don't necessarily taken. think he knew that it would stop a bullet, but he might have thought there's probably going to be a bullet involved in the next interaction here. This is better than nothing mm. because it would be better than nothing, because even if it didn't stop the bullet, it would slow the bullet down. I guess. Although you would think someone as smart as Bruce Wayne and as paranoid as him would have some sort of under his clothing. I don't think he's clothing. paranoid. You don't? I think he's psych er, suicidally reckless. <laughs> I, I guess there could be uh, an argument made for that. At work, Vicky tells Knox about the Joker's visit, and then Knox shows her the microphone. <laughs> no, you fucking asshole, Knox. Jesus Christ. While you were entertaining, <laughs> fuck you. Just <laughs> eat all of the bags of fetid, discarded body parts. <sighs> Knox shows her the microfish of Bruce's family's death on that particular street corner. So now she knows Bruce's damage. The City Hall crew have given up on having a bicentennial parade and hold a press conference to tell that to the city. The Joker hijacks that broadcast to tell Gotham that at midnight on that day, he's going to drop $20 million in cash on the crowd and issues a challenge to Batman to try and stop him. And at that point, that is when the Federal Bureau of Investigation steps <laughs> Oops, sorry, that, that's a, that doesn't happen. Nope. Bruce freeze frames on Joker's face at the end of that broadcast and has a flashback to his origin story. The killer used that dance with the devil line right before killing Bruce's parents, indicting Jack Napier, the Joker, as the murderer. Mm -hmm. Then Alfred breaks the superhero bro code <laughs> and brings Vicky down to the Batcave when Bruce isn't even in costume. She's like, let me in. And he's like, you're in the Batcave. How much further in do you want to be? <laughs> then she's like, I don't know what to think of all this. And he's like, I'm a walking cliche. I've just got to do this. <laughs> oh, God, what a bad movie. <laughs> so Batman suits up and remote controls his car to blow up all of Axe's chemicals. Joker's not in there, though, and mocks Batman from his own helicopter that we described earlier. Mm -hmm. Joker calls Batman Jr. Birdman, which only makes sense now because in 2004, an older Michael Keaton starred in a movie called Birdman or the Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. Mm. Why the hell did he call him Jr. Birdman? <laughs> I don't know. A bat and a bird. Birds. Yeah, no. Nah. Is Joker a biblical literalist? <laughs> <laughs> they both fly. I know. That's all you need. The Bible calls bats birds. Does it? Yeah. Oh, that's incorrectly because they're mammals. Oh, the Bible has something incorrect. Wow, that's I a know, shocker. right? Shocker. But why is the Joker repeating that crap? Uh, maybe, maybe he is a maybe he's in the, maybe he's a Christian. I don't know. I'm sure. <laughs> if you don't sin, what did Jesus die for? Right. Mm. The night of the festivities, Joker and his goons show up in a bunch of parade floats with obligate floating cartoon balloon characters. As promised, he and his goons start taking cash out of trash bags and throwing it to the crowd, who fall all over themselves 
themselves in an orgy of greed. For all of the work that went into those floats, you'd think the baddies would have a classier way than black trash bags to carry and distribute the cash. <laughs> Not long into that, Joker's men don PPE and the balloons start releasing Smilex gas onto the crowd, killing hundreds of people. We don't see hundreds of people die, but necessarily hundreds of people die. Yeah. Vicky and Knox are barely able to escape. It's not, I think it's Knox sort of says, oh, this is an example of, of uh, Gotham's greed. All these people are grabbing up the money that's being tossed out of the trash bags. It's a poor city. Of course they're going to go for the money. What do you want from these people? They live in a crime-ridden hellhole. How's that greed? These people are clearly all poor. Of course they're going to grab for the money. They're all I, poor, but simultaneously fabulously dressed. That's true. You're right. Well, no one says you can't be classy and poor. No, nobody says that. I mean, rich people say that. That's true. Wow, that got depressing. <laughs> then in the sky. Then in the sky, the bat plane appears and uses its very specific ability <laughs> to grab flying balloons to round up the gas dispenser and release them high above the city. <laughs> Wasn't that convenient? Boy, good thing you had that. <laughs> yeah. And how about that beefcake moonshot? The bat playing up against the moon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, uh, ha, ha, yeah, I get it, yeah. Uh. It's been so long since I've seen this picture, because I, I, oh, in fact, I've never seen this picture. What am I thinking? I don't actually seen Batman, this version of it. And so I didn't, when I saw that whole plane up against the moon, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's going to be used later in other films to go, oh, that's how they came up with the idea of the, the, the bat signal. But no, the bat signal was in the picture, so that whole scene wasn't even necessary. I thought, because no what is it there for? That scene was all of necessary. Why? Because the plane is shaped like the Batman logo. Mm hmm Yeah. So you had to put it on a big backdrop and make it look like the Bat thing. Like, that's why. It was necessary because they could do it, so they had to. <laughs> that's a, that's a, the script says so. Uh, but it's, there's nothing in the script. That's just a, a camera direction. That's cinematography. All right. The cinematography made them do it. <laughs> <laughs> Joker gets upset that Batman stole his balloons, and out of frustration, shoots Bob the Goon. I'm just going to leave that there for a second. <laughs> Bob, give me your gun. Pew. Wow, asshole. <laughs> and, then, and then rather than go like, oh my god, our boss is nuts, and shooting him, they go, oh, let's keep listening to him. Yeah, he turns to everybody else and says, all right, clear this crowd. And the rest of the guys are just like, he just shot that guy, whatever. All right, you people, get the hell out of here. I mean, a real decent criminal would have gone like, okay, this is chaos. We have bags of money. Let's split with it. None of these are decent. <laughs> They're bad criminals. Decent criminals shouldn't crime here, Joe. <laughs> They'd be happier criming somewhere else. Evidently. Joker then faces off with the bat plane that inexplicably fails to kill Joker with strafing or missiles. <laughs> Even with the targeting reticle, like, did you not calibrate your guns? Mm. Come on. <sighs> you couldn't even use the force? Joker points a comically long-barreled handgun at the bat plane, fires, and that brings the plane crashing into the steps of Gotham Cathedral. Would a gun like that even work properly? I... <laughs> Because it's that, that barrel would seem to, like, make the gun less effective, wouldn't it? A, a, a ridiculously long barrel like that? I don't know, Joe. And a handgun? Well, you, you know weaponry better than I do. I mean, I know that some guns have longer barrels than others. True, but nothing like that. That was... No gun has that type of barrel. Yeah. So Vicky goes to investigate the crash site, and the Joker captures her there. He radios for a helicopter at the cathedral in ten minutes. Once Joker and Vicky are on their way up, Batman appears from the wreckage to follow, knocking over all of the pews in a process of walking. <laughs> Joker prevents the police from accessing the bell tower by acid spraying a bell, causing it to fall. That church cathedral seems unusually tall. I mean, they're really up there. Mm hmm. Batman has to fight off a bunch of Joker's goons, who Joker had the foresight to station up there, I guess. <laughs> Good boy, yeah, why are they there? One gives Bats a run for his money before Batman sends him cannonballing down another bell tower stairwell, which if that exists, right, because the bell above this tower got knocked down. Mm. 
and he bangs head into the other one, so the bell is still there, meaning it's another tower. Why did Gordon just, like, give up on the one tower that went up to the same roof? <laughs> if there were more towers. Well, Gordon's not in the best of shape, so maybe that's why he just thought, ah, screw it. I'm exhausted already. But the guys he had with him are. They're fine. Or yeah, should but be. What, they, what are they? They don't really contribute. I mean, he tr remember, he tried to move the bell... When it falls uh, on his own? Uh, oh, I can't do it. Oh, well, let's give up. <laughs> and the other cops don't even help him. They're like, all right, boss. Guess we tried. la dee dee la dee da let's, let's move on. With the goons dispatched, Joker is dancing a ragdoll like Vicky around the rooftop. Now, come on. Lois Lane would have punched him. This woman tries no way to defend herself. It's pathetic. Nope. When she spots Batman, she feigns interest in Joker, and he's distracted long enough for Batman to start pummeling him. There's a turn of events when Joker is able to pull the two down over a ledge. Joker tries to dislodge them by stomping the bricks they're holding onto, but abandons that when his chopper arrives and drops a rope ladder. Batman manages to lasso Joker's leg to a gargoyle, which eventually breaks free and pulls the Joker off the ladder to fall to his death on the street below. In Joker's pocket, they find a pouch with a laugh track. Mm. Would have been awesome if, rather than the uh, grappling thing, Batman just shot out a shark and got on his legs as he was going out to the ladder. Take that. Would have been a good reference to Batman 66. Yep. The film ends with another press conference, this time with Gordon and Dent unveiling their brand new bat signal, which I cannot stress enough, is a horribly inefficient way to request help from anyone, much <laughs> less a superhero. The end. All right, George, does this still work? I kind of think it still works. And I agree with you. I did not care for this movie, but I thought it works, yeah. Yeah, it's dumb and silly in all of the ways that superhero movies are dumb and silly. Mm, well, bad ones. Even good ones. <laughs> Even good ones are kind of dumb and silly because they're freaking superhero movies. Yeah, fair, okay. The premise is dumb and silly. Mm. This one is the first one, though. To take Batman where he belongs, in a dark world. Right. With dark mood and trauma. Like, even though Bruce Wayne's parents were killed in all of the Batman mythos, bringing the fact that it was traumatizing into the story matters and makes you invest more in the character. But does it? I felt like the trauma sort of brushed over. It's not, though. The film opens with an allegory for it. Then he pays his respects on the anniversary of the death. Then we get the discovery of that by Vicky. Then he has the flashback where we get to watch it happen. And then on the rooftop, they have the discussion mid-fight. Batman's like, I made you. You made me first when you killed my parents. The thing is, and this is not a reflection of Michael Keaton's performance, maybe because I've seen a lot of superhero films in which a character dies. The deaths I've seen, especially with Spider-Man, which it just has tons of them, there's more, I feel like there's more humanity there. Whereas with Batman, I just, yes, I understand he's actually trauma, but I don't get the, I just never get the sense that he's really upset about it. It all seems to be suggesting. We just, oh, his parents are shot. So we just, we projected upon him that he's upset. Trauma doesn't mean being upset. Trauma means you're carrying it with you. No, I get it. That it's never formed into a memory. That it is just a visceral feeling in your body and you are trapped in that moment. And I get that Batman was trapped in that moment and he was fighting back in every way that he could as an adult with resources. It just didn't give me that impression that it was all that serious. I'm sorry. It just didn't give that impression in this film. Also, why doesn't the Joker or Naper or whatever shoot the kid? That literally this kid is a witness. And he's old enough to testify. He's old enough to give a, a police sketch of what he looked uh, the, because looked like. Bob the goon was with him and was saying, "Come on, Jack, let's go." Right, and he gets shot the kid and then gone. Could have chose not to. Chose to leave a little chaos in the world. <laughs> and a which witness is on brand for, but chaos. A witness is a form of chaos for him, and chaos is on brand for Jack Napier and the Joker. For that matter. Considering that he got a good, I mean, he literally has a conversation with the guy. How come the cops didn't catch him? I mean, these are famous people in Gotham City, right? The parent and mother of rich people. Which, which, I 
mean, these weren't poor. If they were middle class and poor, okay, maybe I could believe. It, was, it <laughs> wasn't until the, the apartment scene in Vicky's apartment that Bruce knew that Jack Napier killed his parents. No, no, no. I understand that part. That, that I'm not having to... What I'm saying is... In the initial incident, when Bruce sees this man shoot his parents, when the cops have interviewed him and then have found Jack Napier. I don't know. Most violent crimes go unsolved. <laughs> For middle class and poor people, I promise you, these people are the richest people in Gotham City. Somebody would have been arrested. Now they're dead, so they're not rich anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kid, which means there's a trustee involved. Like, nobody has access to his resources now. All right, whatever. It just wouldn't have ended there. But all right, his parents are shot. Like I said, if this were poor people or a middle class family, okay, I can believe it. But uh, two rich white people, somebody would have been arrested. There's no way that crime would have been. Nobody got oh, charged. Chances it? are somebody was arrested, Joe. It was just some unsuspecting black guy. <laughs> then it would have been brought up in the movie. No one's arrested for it. All right. But I, I just made this darker than it needs to be, I guess. Anyway, I think the film still works. I didn't like it. I think they're way better superheroes movies. They've done it. Did you much like better. it more than Batman sixty six? Oh, it's way better than Batman sixty six. Okay. There's no question about That's it. That's the There's... important metric here. <laughs> Is it really okay? Yeah. In that case, yes. It's a far superior film. Is that really hard? Is that really <laughs> no, hard? No, it's not. <laughs> the far superior. It cleared that very low bar. <laughs> All right. Moving on. What's next, buddy? Next week, we're talking about Jackie Brown from 1997, a movie that apparently has Michael Keaton in it. That's right. Yes, we're going to have Michael back. I have to say, I remember this being a very good film, but I've only seen it once. So we'll see if it still holds up. Have you ever seen it? I've seen it zero. Okay, good. So it'll be fresh eyes for you and a revisit for me. But that's next time. Right now, I have to say, that's it for this episode. I'm Joe Dixon. Thanks for listening. And I'm George Romacca. Thanks for listening indeed, because if a podcast drops and there's nobody around to hear it, it's just another collection of ones and zeros that doesn't matter. This town needs an enema. You've been listening to Does This Still Work? Produced by Joe Dixon and George Romacca. The hosts can be reached via social media, email, or the contact page at dtswpod.com. Be good to yourself and others, because that still works. Name again? Vol. <laughs> it, 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 it looks like what, how you would spell the wind getting knocked out of No, it's fine. I, I, I just thought it was funny. What I liked about Past Lives is a movie about this Korean woman. If you could invent a holiday, what would it be? Would Friends have been a successful TV show if they made Chandler gay? What book or series do you wish you could live in? Which sports? Do you think have more of a future, baseball and hockey or basketball and soccer? So if you could be the best in the world at something, what would it be? Would you attend a testicle festival?